I'm sure many of you know that this is an annual event, which is uh, in commemoration of Cathy Marsh, who many people here may have, may have worked with back in the day. He was an inspirational social scientist and statistician. So the Royal Statistical Society and the Social Research, Research Association together founded this annual event to really pay tribute to her life and to her passion for using social science and statistics to answer the big questions of our day. Um, obviously, we're la last year I believe that the, the lecture was on the use of statistics in the EU referendum campaign, which I think was probably <coughs> lively, to say the least. I think today's topic is probably equally contentious and has become, I think, a very hot topic as well, so I'm hoping we'll get lots of sparks flying tonight. Um, so to, to, in, to introduce Danny, uh, many of you I'm sure will be familiar with his work. Danny is a professor of geography and has been one of the leading analysts and thinkers around inequality internationally and in the UK. And some of his recent books have included uh, Inequality in the 1% and the, and the Equality Effect. So I think it's a particularly good week to be thinking about the 1% uh, with some of the, new, some of the things that have been in the news. So we may or may not get into some of those questions. So, Danny, if I can ask you to come up and start us off. Uh, thanks ever so much. Thanks for the invite to be here. How unequal is the UK? Uh, the inequality that for me matters most is income inequality. And by income inequality, we are the most unequal country in Europe. That is the case whether you measure it by ratios of the best of 10% to the worst of 10% or by how much the 1% take, or by the Gini coefficient that the OECD prefer. Occasionally, Estonia or Latvia just pips us. But they're small countries, the error's high on them. We consistently are up there all the time, above every other country in Europe. It's a global race that we're winning. It's something that we are very good at, is being very, very unequal. Above us are places like South Africa and Brazil and the United States, Russia, Turkey. That's the kind of game that we're playing. Should we care? Well, of course people are going to say that they care. The important thing that we need to realise is that we don't care very much. That's why we are so unequal. The reason why countries in the rest of Europe are more equal than we are is because they care more about it. If I was giving this talk in Helsinki or Oslo or Berlin or Paris, the people in the audience would be more bothered about the issue, which is partly why they've managed to keep inequalities down. The picture there is a very famous and overused picture from 1936. Our income inequalities are now back to 1936. That is where we are. That picture was the slightly embarrassing Harrow Eaton cricket match the free working class boys were getting pennies by bringing cushions to hire for upper class boys whose bottoms couldn't stand the weight. Um, but the working class boys are looking cocky, if you look at it, and the upper class boys are looking nervous because it was 1936 and things were changing. It's quite a sad story, that picture, because the two upper class boys died very shortly after that picture was taken. The working class boys have lived a long uh, life afterwards. And the country became more and more equal after that picture was taken. I could show you thousands of graphs like this. I'm just gonna show you one. Um, this is the take of the 1% as estimated from tax records. The last peak we were at was around about 1913 when the Titanic sank, when the 1% took about a fifth of all income, when the most common job for women in the country was to be a servant. That kind of inequality was common in the rich world back then. Inequalities fell in the 1920s and 30s. People didn't notice. They fell further. They fell even further in the UK than in France. By the mid-1970s, we were the second most equal large country to Sweden. We actually had won the competition. We'd done really well. 1970s was the best decade in the last century, as far as I can work out. 
And then things went wrong. The turning point was 1979. Yeah, that date matters. It is absolutely obvious. And unlike France, which saw a small increase in inequality, we didn't manage to put a hold on it. We didn't manage to stop it. We just went up and up and up. Now, I'll talk about what's happened recently later, and it's very interesting. But the point is to watch our inequality go out of control while other people manage to control the greedy in their societies. What we're seeing now on the news is news about what happens if you let the greedy get very, very greedy. Eventually, they get found out. Income inequalities matter not as and in themselves. It's what happens when you have them. It's only because of income inequalities that you get wealth inequalities. They lag behind income inequalities. If you have lower income inequalities, then the gap, for instance, between men and women is less and you get less sexism in a society. Uh, that young man is holding a sign saying, no, I don't sell cocaine. Why would students at the University of Oxford assume he's selling coca cocaine? It's because of the colour of his skin. And why would the colour of his skin mean that they would think he was selling cocaine? It's because some people who are not white were poorer in the past and were more likely to sell drugs because they were poorer. And some people had a lot of money and could buy drugs. I think it's still the case that the highest rate of cocaine use in Europe is around us. We're in the city of London now. It's worth celebrating that fact. And when people check the water in the sewage from here, they find it's very, very high. But the reason for putting that picture up is to say that income inequality matters for so much more than just income. And this is the inequality between families and between individuals. I think David will worry a bit about the inequality between generations, but they are tiny compared to the inequality between individuals and families. And if you reduce the inequality between individuals and families, you reduce the inequality between generations. At the moment, you can be young and saying life is very hard here in the city of London, but essentially, if you come from a rich family, they will look after you and help you rent that flat and eventually buy that house. Whereas if you're from a poor family, that kind of thing isn't possible. We are beginning to find out more and more and more things which are damaged by inequality that we didn't know were damaged by inequality. The spirit level, which came out in 2009, looked at about 13 things that appear to be correlated with inequality. Now, these correlations are hard to prove, but as more and more academics begin to study inequality, it's really interesting what they find. The most important one, I don't think I have a slide on it, is climate change and pollution. Carbon pollution per head is much higher in more unequal rich countries than in more equal rich countries. This really matters. It's part of the reason why climate change deniers tend to be on the right, because they hate the idea that the climate might be in trouble, because if the climate's in trouble, you can't run an economy the way they want to run economies. But the thing which most interests me at the moment is how living in a country of high inequality may actually be damaging our thinking. You can look at international tests of how well people do, particularly up to age 24. Us in the USA are particularly bad at logic tests, at mathematics and so on. You can think back to those boys with their top hats from Harrow and the other boys. Separating children in schools is bad. The OECD have shown it's bad. It reduces your overall performance academically. Um, but the, the one I'm going to point out, and this is hard to understand because we are in the middle of this, so we tend to think that things are sensible because we're living in such an unequal society. Either we have created the most amazing student loan system and the rest of Europe just has to catch up and understand how clever we are, or we've done something very, very stupid. Underlying the student loan system is the idea that in the future things will carry on being very unequal, so graduates will carry on having very high wages, so we'll be able to recoup from their high wages the cost of their tuition. The student loan system is a system predicated on the need for future inequality. Worse than that, you can sell the system. I, I think the officials just didn't notice this. I've been having a debate with Nick Hillman about this, and I think he just didn't get it. Um, you sell the system, I think it's fair. 
why should middle class people get a higher education when working class people more often don't? But of course, the way the student loan system works, if you're from a very wealthy family, you have no loan. You have nothing. Because your mum and dad or your grandparents pay the fees. So the loans are for the lower middle class and the upper working class students, not for the children of the very well off. The fact that I'm having to explain this to you and say it's bad is because we've been in an unequal country for some decades and it's reduced our collective ability not to make a mistake as big as that enormous mistake, which we're going to get our way out of at some point in the future. People often say inequality has been falling for some time, why are you worrying about it? And this is all about statistics, we're in the Royal Statistical Society, so I'm allowed a couple of minutes to go on about this. And it actually is fascinating, we now measure inequality in so many different ways that you can begin to see a pattern to the changing shape of inequality. The bar graph at the bottom, for those who've got very good eyesight, is the ratio of the medium of the best of quintile to the worst of quintile of households. Um, because it's the median, it's completely ignoring the top 10% and the bottom 10%. And if you completely ignore the top 10% and the bottom 10%, then inequality peaked in 1990 when Margaret Thatcher resigned. And since then, it's been going down a little bit and we've all been becoming a bit more equal. Except I just lied. I said, we all. I'm not in the bottom 90%. I'm in the top 10%. This doesn't apply to me. I could show you that graph of things getting better over the time and tell you what you're complaining about. It's all been getting better. And I would be lying because I'm not part of the 90%, I'm part of the 10. Now the huge line at the top helps a bit to understand why we haven't been getting more equal since 1990. That is the rising take of the 1%. We got to a point by the end of the 1990s when 99% of people were getting more equal, but it still doesn't matter if 1% are taking more and more. And the amount they're taking is absolutely enormous. This is a sixth of all income by the end. The drop Nobody celebrates the drop. Why don't they celebrate the drop? Because the drop came in when Gordon Brown finally got the courage to put the top tax rate up to 50p. And people in the top 1%, but not that high, in the bottom half of the top 1%, got their accountants to help them set up companies with no employees so they could avoid the tax. Tax avoidance is the life of people in the top 1% and half a percent. It's what you begin to do. And so that's not a real drop, that's a drop in declared income. But we may be getting a little bit better news. Something is going on. And what's really interesting is that when this something goes on, nobody is celebrating it, which is really good news. And it's very similar to what happened in the 1920s and 30s, when inequalities then fell from that 1913 peak. This is a quote from the High Pay Centre, from a report that came out in August of this year, about huge drops in the reported income of chief executive officers in Britain. And the story, if you want to look into it, gets even better in the detail, because the drop was bigger for male CEOs than female CEOs, so we have increased gender equality within our CEOs, and the drop was even bigger for the CEOs at the very top of the pile who were getting the most. The same thing was reported a year earlier in the United States about a million dollars average fall in the recorded remuneration of, I think it's the Fortune 500 CEOs. People were not sure, they thought they found a tricky way to get the money in some other way. But as yet, I haven't seen that proved. And the average earnings of people in the bottom in the USA rose by $900 a year, and it balanced out the fall. This is the first fall in my lifetime, first big fall in my lifetime, no celebrations in the United States, no celebrations here. The reaction to this is, well, they get too much, and we need a lot more of that before we're going to be happy. And that's great. That's the right reaction uh, to have. The news today about the Queen's advisers misleading her, and is it the Duke of Westminster, whoever else, here we're heading into the 1% of the 1% of the 1%. 
and we're heading into a change in moral sentiment that again we saw before where it is just seen as wrong. But what we don't know enough about is why it's wrong. We don't know enough about the harm that's caused to a country and the people in that country when you allow the gaps between them to get wider and wider and wider because we are used to it. We think that things are okay here. People who go on about it being terrible, you know, they're over-egging the case. But as I said at the beginning, we are the most unequal country in Europe. To be poor in this country is far worse than to be poor in France, poor in Germany. Far, far worse than to be poor in Scandinavia. Better than to be poor in the United States of America. This is turnout in elections. Now, I'm not going to give you any R squareds or anything. I just want to show you a, a couple of these kind of relationships. There are always exceptions. In Australia, it's compulsory to vote. Some plucky 9% of Australians defy the law. I'm very impressed by them. Singapore is a lovely country for exceptions. It's not compulsory to vote in Singapore, but if you don't vote and never want to vote again, you have to pay a fine. Um, but in general, you'll see, as a country or a state of the United States becomes more unequal, people are less inclined to take part in the democratic process. At the same time, as a graph I'm not showing you, they're less numerate, less able to solve problems, less literate. They're also more likely to vote far right, if you call voting Republican in the last US election far right. That graph goes the opposite way. Uh, the recent rising far-right voting in Germany simply put Germany in the right point on this graph. It voted unusually low for the far-right before. You can't say that inequality causes all these things, but they're really interestingly related. And we need to reduce inequalities. We need to aim to become like the normal country in Europe, that's Switzerland or the Netherlands. We can't aim to become the best in Europe, that isn't achievable without revolution, even in my children's lifetime. But we could set a target of being the average for Europe for inequality and look at all the benefits that come with that. And the amount of money you save, which is absolutely enormous. And you get rid of all this rubbish in your media about job creation and wealth creators and stuff, which is just insulting people's intelligence. Uh, that graph is designed to test whether you're red-green colourblind. If you can't see anything, I'm afraid you may be red-green colourblind. If you can see a diagonal stripe in the graph, uh, that is the generation who ever managed to buy a house. Uh, the red that is now spreading out more recently are the young people who are not going to be able to buy a house who are renting. You can't just make incomes more equal, although it's good to do that. We're beginning to see that. The civil service are now publishing income ratios and every time they publish them again they go down because what chief executive officer of a civil servant department wants to appear to be greedy? And hell, when you're on £200,000 a year, being on 195 isn't that bad. As soon as you publish pay ratios, the inequalities begin to fall. But you also have to worry about things like the rent. Rent is twice what a mortgage is. It is unfair. You can't have uncontrolled rents. Part of thinking badly that happened in Britain as inequality rose is we, were, we became taught that rent regulation, which is normal in Europe, creates slums and is terrible. That kind of stupidity is only possible in a country as unequal as Britain. You know, we don't have rent regulations. We have the most expensive, worst quality housing in the continent. Right? It shouldn't be rocket science to begin to work out the two are connected. But we had this strange way of thinking that got things badly, badly wrong. I shouldn't say this in the Royal Statistical Society because there's no way of proving it. But it's really interesting that the most unequal country in the rich world, the United States, voted for Donald. The second, most lar second largest unequal country in the rich world voted Brexit. And the third in Europe of the big countries, which is Spain, decided it was a good idea to lock up some Catalonian leaders. Um, this is all anecdote, but 
countries which are more economically equal tend to run themselves a bit better, tend not to get into such messes. If we're looking at Norway and Switzerland, by the way, as options out, it's really important to realise that Switzerland is much, much more equal than us. The top 1% in Switzerland take half as much as our top 1% and do a somewhat better job of banking on half the wages. And Norway is dramatically more equal than us. Right. The Swiss and Norwegian model may not be open to us. Uh, I do wonder whether we're actually going to be able to afford to Brexit, but I'll leave that with you. And of course, when you look at who voted and why they voted, people voted for anything but this, for a way out, for something other than what they were being presented with. I learnt yesterday that the most votes to leave by constituency were in the four middle deciles of constituency in England, where 80% of constituencies voted majority out, which were mostly Tory constituencies. Poor Conservatives in relatively poor areas for Conservatives is what the out vote was about. For social science, this kind of thing is fascinating. You begin to zoom in and work out what happens to a population when you treat them like this. The only problem is that I happen to be living here and we're going to have to go through it. <laughs> the fact that we even have to ask whether inequality is a problem shows the problem that we have. I hope in future it becomes accepted as simply normal and we move on to other things in the way that sexism is seen as a problem and racism is seen as a problem. Allowing the gaps between people to be enormous in terms of how much we respect them, which is what pay is about, is as bad as accepting racism and accepting sexism. I put up J.B. Priestley and Inspector Calls for people of my age and older. Um, it's again about the moral sentiment changing. The moral sentiment, this is a phrase used by Oswald Folks, who was a banker and a friend of John Maynard Keynes who told John Maynard Keynes that what he'd really achieved was not a great new theory of economics. He'd helped the change of the moral sentiment that was underway at his time in the 1930s. And my final slide. If all of this doesn't matter too much to you and it's too vague, think about this. Now, this was the weakest of the 13 correlations in the spirit level published about eight years ago, the correlation with life expectancy. It was the weakest correlation with inequality because what affects your life uh, chances are things that occur all the way from when you were born, through when you were a child, through adolescence, through middle age. And for those of you of my age or older, you spent your childhood in one of the most equitable places. So you can't simply correlate inequality with life expectancy. But it's still, as the graph shows, doesn't correlate too badly. The UK currently, for women, has a lower life expectancy than Austria, Belgium, Cyprus, Finland, France, Germany, Greece, Iceland, Ireland, Italy, Liechtenstein, Luxembourg, Malta, the Netherlands, Norway, Portugal, Slovenia, Spain, Sweden, and Switzerland, just in Europe. I force myself to read that out because the list is long and it isn't excusable. The missing country, by the way, is Denmark. The Danes have done the world a service, sadly for the Danes, of smoking an awful lot to show that even if you do everything else right, I'm afraid, you can't have too many cigarettes. Uh, the great news is that young Danes have stopped smoking. On October the 27th, the Office of National Statistics released the latest projections for future life expectancy. In footnote 7, they said that by 2047, men can expect to live a year less than they previously thought, women can expect to live around a year less than they previously thought. This is a million years of life minimum, which we now think will not be lived in the future because things have actually got absolutely worse. Pension funds have already taken 310 billion of liabilities of future pension projections because we're not going to live as long. And if ONS, if the principal projection is right, who's going to be most effective? At the moment, it's the old who are dying more, particularly old women. But the age group are going to be most effective. 80% of the people who are going to die early, if the ONS projections 
are correct are aged between 40 and 60 now. It's me and it's most of you. But it's entirely changeable. These are projections. This is what happens. People die young. People live in poverty. Their education is bad. The country is run badly. The rich squirrel their money away in tax havens and your country even supports tax havens. This is what happens if you tolerate high inequality. Begin to stop tolerating it. And slowly and gradually, with every year that passes, you become angry about it. You actually begin to care. If you think we care now, wait to see how much people will care in a few years' time about it. The caring doesn't go away as the inequalities fall. The caring actually increases. And then you find that you can do things like provide rural bus services for elderly people, provide social service visits, of which we've cut half a million. You can run a health service decently. If we wanted to fund our health service at the same level that the Germans fund theirs, we would have to spend an extra billion a week. Forget that 350 million on the side of the bus, it was wrong. It should have said a billion. And of course the Germans pay more into the EU as well and spend an extra billion a week on their health service. But if you want to be really ambitious, look at Switzerland, where they spend twice as much. How can the Swiss do that? Because they care about each other. What is our problem? We don't care about each other enough to respect each other enough to think that the people who clean this room are worth as much as the people who get to talk in this room. Thank you very much. to welcome Lord David Willits, um, who is going to be uh, following that and hopefully sparking off some useful uh, controversy. So many of you will know uh, David is the executive chair of the Resolution Foundation, who are putting out so much of the cutting edge analysis around this topic at the moment. Uh, he was an MP for more than 20 years, was uh, Minister for Universities and Science. He's also a visiting professor at King's College London. It's uh a great honour to be participating in this debate with Danny. Uh, and as you said, we at Resolution are trying to do work in this area. And indeed, uh, some of the data I'm about to pre uh, present to you will be released in the next week or two in our latest uh, Resolution Foundation publication, Unequal Results. And one of the things that we will be arguing there, actually, is that there is, as always, a requirement for more and better data, and particularly as we look at the imperfections in HBAI statistics and uh, other sources of data that are used, uh, the, um, the importance of turning and harnessing better administrative data and linking those in to our existing data sets really uh, is crucial. And when I was the minister, I did try to create the administrative data network and the confidential points where people can access administrative data. That data is still not being integrated as much into the wider use of survey and conventional HMRC and HBAI data. And I hope that people in this room will be taking the opportunities to do more with it. Um, Let's start with kind of the question which Amartya Sen asked, inequality of what? And there are different forms of inequality. And because life is sadly just a bit more complicated than in the previous presentation, you may even find there are trade-offs between different inequalities that you care about. And tackling one has an offsetting effect on another. Um, there's inequality of income of course, and even within that there are different measures. Is it the top 1% you care about? Um, and certainly there are features of the British economy and particularly our concentration in financial services which has meant that historically we've had a phenomenon of the top 1%. Is it the gap between them and the rest? Is it the top 10% versus the other 90%? Is it the 10th percentile against the 90th? Is it distribution? There are a range of different forms of even of income inequality 
And you may find that you can make progress on some whilst going backwards on others. And that's before we turn to other forms of inequality, which I list there. Intergenerational equality, I will make a bit of a pitch for that as not just uh, uh, income equality because what you do observe is that for people in the middle who, especially if they're in the baby boomer generation, would have been very likely to have owned their own home and been building up a funded pension, in other words, crucial assets, uh, for people in the middle now in England, it looked, uh, the, in the younger generation, it looked much harder for them to participate in that form of wealth ownership, of property owning democracy. And that's a significant social change in our society and it's merits investigation and it's not completely caught just by inequality of income. I personally think the gap between going to university and not going to university is an increasingly significant social and economic gap. If you look at the Robert Putnam uh, book Our Kids came out about 18 months ago. The social divide, indeed, it's ba such a fundamental social divide in America that basically every one of his graphs, the axis, is graduates versus non graduates. So it's showing wider gaps between them. So I think getting more people to university is incredibly important. I'm not going to devote my entire lecture to engaging with Danny's comments on how we fund higher education, but I'm sure I'm going to touch on it and it may come up in QA. And there's the wider social backdrop. That 1936 photograph is indeed very powerful. But those kids, the poor kids in 1936, were operating in a Britain where there was no NHS, where there was no uh, tax-financed secondary education, where there was not the equivalent of our funding and opportunities for them to go to university, which is now far greater than any point in our nation's history. So the backdrop against which your income inequality is played out also matters, the access to public services. And, and final comment on Danny before I turn to my analysis. Something that I know people don't like about the way in which some, including some members of my party, I'm a member of the Conservative Party, I take the Tory whip in the Lords, um, talk about income inequality is by defending it in moral terms, as if the fact that you have got more money or more wealth is a moral judgment on your superiority. Uh, and Hayek, uh, shortly after Michael Young's Rise of Meritocracy came out, Hayek, in his Constitution of Liberty, discusses this. And his argument is, uh, we should not attach moral value to being highly paid versus being less well paid. These market returns are not moral assessments. So we should, and his, his view was that if you get into the language of merit, and you could argue Michael Young was doing that ironically, but if you get into the language of merit, that makes these differences in income much less, much more painful and, and are misplaced. Well, I would say to Danny, I also think that it's dangerous getting into the moral judgments the other way around. I don't assume that because people are highly paid or have a large amount of, of money, that means they are automatically greedy. And when we look at returns in our society, those top 1%, there are lots of bankers, but there are lots of sportsmen, there are lots of uh, people in the performing arts, there are film stars. I don't think they are all morally inferior. I think one of the questions is to what extent you wish to regard the distribution of market returns as a moral judgment either way, of moral superiority or inferiority. And I'm not confident of our ability to make either of those sets of moral judgments. Now, let me, let me get bring in some data and this is important because I think this have we got, have we got a clicker that shows uh, I'm not sure no that wasn't the right quick line um, I think this brings out some quite in questions about the trade-offs that you face in the real world so let's look at this period now Danny says it started in 1979 I wonder what happened in 1979 um, although some of the data goes, doesn't, is limited, if anything, it looks as if it happened post the IMF cuts of 76. Um, the, if, if you look at the scenario of Thatcher's Britain, you will see, indeed, that there was a growth in inequality with people at the top end, in the top 10%. These are, these are pay. I'm going to come to household incomes in a moment. These are pay figures. You can absolutely see that for people in the bottom 10 or 20%, they barely had any increase in their real incomes, and for people in the top 10%, they had the biggest increase in their incomes. 
However, you will also observe that for the vast majority of people in Britain, they had more substantial annual increases in their incomes than in any other period since. So if you really care about inequality, I fully understand, I'm not going to defend what happened to the bottom 10 or 20%, but this terrible period, you can understand why governments won landslide elections in this supposedly terrible period. This was delivering increases of 2% per year in real pay for the vast majority of people in Britain. Now, you then have, uh, you then have periods in, and, and you might prefer 1996 to 2004, where you do much better for the people at the bottom. So that's clearly helping them much more substantially. On the other hand, for most people, the increases in their incomes were already diminishing, were already less than they were. It's undoubtedly the case that the period where we have done best in inequality is the most recent period, 2008 to 16. Although it, it's also got imperfections, you can see there was an effort at the bottom end. And that was partly that in the early years of the crisis, when many benefits were linked to prices and pay, pay was, uh, and, and pay, sorry, no, it's partly because we were trying in the public sector, and I can remember the cabinet discussions, we were saying, although we're trying to having to cut budgets, we must protect the pay increases of the least well-paid public sector workers. You also had a strong rule across the public sector of nobody earning more than the Prime Minister, plus you had the banking crisis and financial crisis. So in terms of equality, 2008 to 16 isn't bad, apart from the fact that for the vast majority of society, their pay was going down in real terms by 1% a year. There are a series of judgments you will make about these distributions, and no, they are not morally unambiguous. There are a series of trade-offs which reasonable people may reach different views, and I hope we might discuss them in the course of the evening. Now, there's a somewhat similar picture. Now, this is a, this is a different measure. This is uh, household incomes, and it allows for housing costs, and Danny was right, housing costs are a crucial feature, and it's a growing feature. Um, and again, it's, it forces us to confront some of these trade-offs, which are painful. Uh, again, I have to say that the, uh, that the recent period looks quite, it, it, in, in this respect, it's, it's the same picture that 2007-8 to 2016-17 um, has done. We're pretty flat, but at least we're equal. I don't think Britain 2008 to 16 has been a noticeably more happy society than Britain in the 1980s. It's clearly been more equal. It's clearly also had far lower real increases in living standards. The bad news, and this is what we do worry about at Resolution Foundation, is when you look ahead, it looks as if we are about to engage in a particularly painful period when we could have a combination of continuing very low income growth, but with a significant deterioration uh, in equality caused by the uh, freeze in the cash value of many working age benefits, with, which has ended up being a more savage freeze than was intended because we've now got inflation at 3%. Uh, you could say that you could, we, historically what Britain has been bouncing around between in the last 30 years is a quite a good performance on incomes but with some increasing inequality or quite a, quite a poor performance on incomes but with some reduction in inequality and we're now about to have a period with some pretty flat incomes and some increase in inequality as well. Uh, and uh, that, would be, that would be particularly worrying. Now, uh, this is, uh, and again, this is an area of analysis where I very much agree with Danny. I think housing costs matter, and housing costs has become increasingly important um, as, the, as rents have uh, gone up, and as I'm already running tight for time. Um, this is an important issue, which there are people in this room who will be more expert on than me, but there is indeed a genuine debate about the quality of the statistics, which we'll be getting in, in our report as to... Um, uh, how they are uh, measured and whether you uh, look at the tax benefit measure or you look at HBAI with some particular adjustment for people at the top end, you get different pictures. But yes, it has indeed. It does look as if the top 1% has done well in the last 30 years. But that has been consistent with very different patterns of income for people in the middle, as I showed you earlier. Um, 
as I said, which ratios do you care about? This is digging deeper into the statistics. What ratio do you care about the people right at the top? Are you more about people in the middle versus the people at the top, people in the middle versus the bottom? Um, though again, the pattern that housing costs has become an increasingly significant issue. The most important theme that has come out from the intergenerational commission that I'm chairing at Resolution Foundation, and which comes out from this work on poverty, is the way in which increasing housing costs and higher rents is having a big impact on uh, uh, living standards and income pressures in the UK. I agree with Danny on that. Uh, now, let me, so that's my kind of picture, and I'm sorry in some ways it's a bit more complicated than Danny's, but there are trade-offs, and politicians of different political parties can, insofar as we can shape things, and politicians have limited power to shape these things, can make within the realms of acceptable British liberal democracy different judgments about the equity, efficiency trade-off. Now, um, let me briefly give you a pitch for the intergenerational issue and why I think this does merit attention in its own right. I'm not claiming it's the full story for Britain, but when I wrote my book, The Pinch, which came out in 2010, there's virtually no analysis of post-war Britain looking at it from the perspective of different generations. There was a lot on of course, on social class, on ethnicity, on gender. But I thought that there was another story, not the full story, but another important story, uh, part of the whole, namely what was happening to different generations. And here you can see that at first, and here, um, here I'm looking at five-year groups. I'll turn to generations in a second. But you can see, because the five-year group shows the pattern very clearly, where at first, for successive groups, born 51 to 55 and 56 to 60, each one, in real terms, in their 20s, has higher pay than the group before them. And then if you look across at the left, you see that this process has essentially come to a halt with no significant progress for the later generations, and if anything, for the 86 to 90 cohort, they've gone backwards. They are, they, we're talking about people in their 20s earning less in real terms in their 20s than people of the same age 5, 10, 15 years before them. This is a change in the, and a breach of a social contract that we thought we had of successive generations being better off. Um, here's another way of looking at it, what's happened on the, uh, on the effect of the crisis. And of course, the story is not just a pay story for the younger generation, it's also a housing cost story. It's access to housing, uh, decline, again, we were used to the idea that successive generations would be more likely to be homeowners. That's now gone into reverse, less likely to be homeowners. Uh, and, uh, and here, again, the story that I find this the most powerful of the how bits of housing evidence, that the proportion of their incomes that people in their 20s are having to devote to housing costs now very significant and higher than for any previous cohort that we can identify. So they've both got virtually no increase in their incomes and then a significant part, a growing part of their incomes going in housing costs, leaving them with less discretionary spending. Uh, this is tough for the millennials born between 1981 and 2000. Now, um, and here's another way of, uh, of presenting this evidence where again, yeah, it does add up to, I think, a very significant story when you compare it with the social attitudes. Um, wealth accumulation has also got to drive it. There's not time for that. So uh, for, wealth, for wealth successive generations, the, the, the gain of people's wealth on the previous generation on five-year gaps also now gone negative. Um, so I just wanted, to, just wanted to argue the evidence, to use the evidence to argue that there is an issue about fairness between the generations where something rather important, what we expect for future generations, is not being delivered. Let me briefly turn to uh, graduates and non-graduates. Um, and here are the crude figures for what's um, happening to the, to the incomes of graduates relative to non-graduates. There's a much more sophisticated story behind it. And if you really want to follow the argument, I have a book on the subject out in the next couple of weeks. Uh, a university education published by Oxford University Press, and it has got a chapter on how we fund higher education. It's also got this kind of evidence that going to higher education, going into university is the most transformation experience available to young people to boost their life chances. And uh, the more young people that have that opportunity, the better. 
just let me briefly comment on Danny's point. Uh, he, he, he's, he's worried that 10%, uh, that 10 or so, I think it's probably close to 10 than 15, 10% of students don't take out a loan at all. Their families have the resources, presumably in some way, to pay for them directly. Uh, these, there is some of that effect. That is absolutely the case. I don't regard it as a knockdown objection to a graduate repayment scheme. After all, for a start, in the old days, they would have had the generality of taxpayers, many of them far less affluent than they were, paying directly for their higher education. Now, these people, because they are affluent, in Danny's argument, are paying themselves direct. The, paying, you, the generality of taxpayers paying for the higher education of people of high incomes who are going to go on to have high-paid jobs is not a particularly progressive feature of the welfare state. And as graduates, by and large, go on to earn more, it's reasonable to expect those graduates who do earn more, who if they have, as the vast majority have, participated in the fees and loan scheme, then to repay. If you're a less well-paid graduate, you don't repay. The exact uh, calibration of that model, how much you want them to repay, what the repayment threshold should be, all those are absolutely legitimate subjects of political and social decision over the next 30 years. But by and large, as graduates earn more than non-graduates, expecting graduates to pay back for their higher education, but not by putting an overdraft around their necks or a credit card debt or a mortgage, but saying through the income tax system we will collect a further 9% from your earnings until you have paid for the cost of your higher education, and don't worry, if you're not in a well-paid job, you won't pay back, seems to me to be a reasonable fair and progressive way of doing it. And it's had the great advantage, it's enabled us to get rid of number controls, to enable more people to go to university. And those people, get extra people going to university are almost all from those marginal groups that Danny and I most care about. When you have restrictions in access to higher education, it's not the rich kids that don't go, it's the kids from the poorer backgrounds that don't go. I was used to have this argument with Vince Cable when we were ministers together in biz. He represented Twickenham, a very affluent part of Britain with 63% people under 30 going to university. I represented a much poorer constituency with a big council estate, haven't on the south coast, with 23% of young people going to university. If the only way I could get more kids from haven't going to university is it would by, by fewer people from Twickenham going to university, then it was going to be a very long wait for my constituents. I wanted to get rid of number controls and I have more people in total going. Now, my very final point about attitudes to inequality. Uh, this this is, I love this essay by Hume on envy, but the, the in, and there is a bit of latest social science research which confirms it. Hume is saying the things that you really care about are actually not what the top 1% get or the top 10% get. It's the subtle differences in your own social and, and neighbourhood environment. It's people in the workplace who are just slightly better paid than you are. It's people in the street who've got slightly better consumer goods than you have. The th kind of inequalities that wind people up can sometimes be the small day-to-day -day ones, not the fundamental ones of that pop star or that uh, banker. And this is another point on attitudes. One of the reasons why intergenerational equity is so interesting, and so, as well as being very important, is this is people saying, uh, that every generation should have a higher standard of living than the one that came before it. It's a kind of inequality. This is people saying, we expect the next generation to be rather better off than we are. It's an embrace of a sort of inequality by saying we expect society to progress, we accept that the younger generation we paid a bit more than we were at the same age. This is the social contract that many modern societies embrace, and it has got an element of an embrace of inequality in it. It's saying, yes, they're going to be better off than we are. And what is it that people are most unhappy about? It's that precisely this mechanism, delivering improved living standards for the younger generation, is not working in the way that they thought it should. So part of the interesting paradox about this attitude is that, in a way, people want to see their kids earning a bit more than they did at the same age. And they're very unhappy when they don't. So let me conclude. I do think inequality matters. My view of inequality has changed. 30 years ago, I'd have said inequality does not matter. I completely accept that where you are relative to other people does matter. 
and I buy the argument that it has effects on one's well-being and one's health. But when you try to wrestle with it close up as public policy, and you look at the performance of the British economy, you find there are some quite difficult trade-offs, and it's not completely obvious if we went back and you could choose which of those time periods since 1975 that you would, pref would regard as the superior one. It's not completely obvious what the right answer is. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you very much, David. So, I'm now going to welcome our final speaker, Wanda, who is Executive Director at the Equality Trust. So this is her day-to-day -day bread and butter, is leading their work to try and improve the quality of life in the UK by reducing social and economic inequality. Wanda is also a visiting fellow at York University and in previous jobs has been a leader within the union movement of looking at inequalities across all sorts of different dimensions, including ethnicity, gender, child poverty, social mobility. So Wanda is going to come and help us to reflect on what we've just heard from these two quite different points of view, and that will take us into debate and Q&A afterwards. So, Wanda. Thank you, and thank you for inviting me. Um, I'm very delighted to be here this evening in the company of such distinguished speakers and I'm sure a very distinguished audience. Um, as a woman, first of all, as a woman born in 1971, I'm really far more worried than I was when I entered this room this evening um, about what the future holds. Um, it was a fascinating blend of pessimism, more pessimism, and a glimmer of hope, if Danny's right, about already having hit peak inequality. Um, obviously, there's a contrast there between having hit pe peak inequality and the Resolution Foundation saying that we're heading to, towards levels last seen under Margaret Thatcher, so hoping to tease that out in debate as well. Um, I like Hume's quote, um, but I don't think there is a poverty of envy um, among us. I think with the rise of social media, um, and I'm you know, sorry to bring up the subject of Kim Kardashian and this, this sort of audience, but you know, we can see the four million pound engagement ring that she's wearing. We can see the riches that people have. And you know, if any of you have young children who are particularly into football, I mean, the endless debates I've had with my eight-year-old son about the relative merits of how much footballers earn and why they should earn that much makes me realise that even from a young age in our society at the moment, children are seeing these role models, and they're not just looking at the children that are around them. They're looking at these role models and saying, OK, you know, I want to be super rich like that. Um, we subscribe to Match of the Day football magazine. And there are three or four pages of footballers cars footballers houses and the rest of it so you know there is no poverty in of envy even at a young age i'm also intrigued by danny's statement that we can't afford to exit the eu because of inequality because i think that's that's um not something that we've heard before and the pages and pages and columns and columns we've heard about brexit if there is a reduction in inequality, then we also have to look at whether it's a good reduction or a bad reduction. And is, is this happening in a positive way or a negative way? I mean, we can look at the gender pay gap. That's decreased, but it's only because men are being paid less. So we have to be careful sometimes what we wish for. Um, and on the subject of pay ratios, um, the high pay centres research out this summer, we at the Equality Trust provide a pay tracker every year uh, where we rank the FTSE um, 100 CEOs. And yes, the gender pay gap has gone down there, but we're talking about a handful of female CEOs out of FTSE 100. And I think a lot of that reduction is down to the fact that Martin Sorrell has decided that he will actually get out of bed for less than 77 million, and his pay's come down to around about 44. Um, you know, I don't know how he's gonna cope, but we, c we can but hope. <laughs> So both Danny and David spoke about education, and we may really want to think about what the purpose of education is. Is this to be fit for work and to earn more money, or is it for the pursuit of knowledge for its own sake? I, mean, I, went, to, I went to university at a time when I was very lucky to choose what most people would think is quite an arcane subject, Polish studies, and devote four or five years to studying Polish literature and history. Now, there was, there was no job that was suitable, really, apart from teaching Polish, obviously, um, that, would have be, that that would have been a good career move for. And I think it's one of the things we should really mourn, the fact that people are choosing their, degree, their university degrees and being very materialistic about it, because they have to, because they're spending the money on, the, on their education and they're trying to really get the best bang for their buck, instead of thinking about some of those subjects that they might actually enjoy studying. But of course, education is a key driver of inequality. And 
going to university, it can be the most transformational um, experience that someone has, but in a way in line with something like taking the 11 plus, you know, if you fail, there's a sense of failure that will be with you for the rest of your life. Now, I talk to a lot of um, student unions, and especially I talk to the gender and race groups at student unions, and what a lot of them have said is that the policy to get more people, more disadvantaged, more disadvantaged young people into education is great, but the where the policy stops, the reality begins. It's often very difficult for people going into a totally different environment to feel at home, to feel that they can do their best, not feel inferior. And so we do have higher dropout rates for disadvantaged children. Now, I was talking on the Moral Maze about elite universities and access to, in particular, Oxford and Cambridge. And one thing that Oxford is very good at is actually the retention rates for disadvantaged students when they actually get there. So we do need to think about how we're supporting people at university, not just getting them there. Now, it's interesting that debates is fo debate is focusing on university attendance and rather forgetting the crucial role that further education plays for those who need a second, a third, fourth, or even fifth chance at education. And it's often dubbed the Cinderella of the education system. And it's being squeezed even more now with, with area reviews as colleges are merging and providing less access in fewer areas, which is a particular, particularly a problem in rural areas as well. But we have to remember that over half of young people do not go to university at all, so we should be talking about them as well. And I'd also like to see whether apprentices, for example, are having a positive pay impact. We know that even at the age of four or five entering school, that disadvantaged young people, young children, are anything up to 18 months behind their more advantaged peers. So we have to be looking at early years education. We have to look at trying to stem that gap at the very beginning, not just looking at university. But as we know, education doesn't necessarily overcome the class divide. As the Social Mobility Commission found, even when they have the same education attainment, role and experience as their more privileged colleagues, those from poorer backgrounds are still paid an average of £2,242 less. Women and ethnic minorities face a double disadvantage in earnings. And it won't surprise you to know that I would also make a pitch for looking at those intersectional inequalities. Income does have an effect on race, race has an effect on income, and gender, and disability, and sexual orientation, and all of the other protected characteristics. So we mustn't just brush that aside as yet another inequality. These in inequalities are working at an intersexual, intersectional, oh, intersexual, that's a new word for me, sorry. Intersectional <laughs> level, possibly intersexual as well, I don't know. Um, and also looking at health. Uh, sorry, also inequality allows exacerbated discrimination. One of the things I've been talking to union audiences about is the role of economic inequality and the role of inequalities together. And it's really gratifying to see that over recent years, we have come out of this idea that we either have to look at economic inequality here and we look at other types of inequality here. They are interlinked and we are now beginning to have a grown-up conversation about how they're interlinked. And health, obviously Danny mentioned health. One of the things I'd like to point out, many of you may be aware of this, but um, it was shocking for me, that infant mortality is on the rise in this country. And this was illustrated very graphically to me um, when my cousin was pregnant this summer and she had her child in Liverpool. And I wondered, she lives in Chester, 20 miles away. Why are you having your child in Liverpool? Chester maternity unit was closed. Wrexham, which was the nearest one, was also closed. She had to drive 20 miles with her partner and her mother, fortunately, who used to be a midwife, in the back of the car. Now, because they had access to someone who used to be a midwife and to a car, the ending came, uh, was, was very well and the child w was healthy and survived. But we know that infant mortality rate is linked to socioeconomic status. If you don't have access to those, to those privileges, then the story is very, very different. Uh, the importance of education lies not only in boosting earning power, but also in social networks. And as we know, a disproportionate number of our MPs, judges and journalists attended just two universities. And this matters for several reasons. If our so-called representatives are not, well, representative of us, then there are questions of legitimacy. And those trade-offs in inequality um, that David was talking about, I think very different people will make very different decisions about what their priorities are for those trade-offs in inequality. And that's why we do need a more diverse government and more representation of society as it really is. And there are also the obvious issues of groupthink and lack of diversity of thought, views, policy, and action. 
Which brings me to the key inequality, really, and we've, we've not touched upon this, um, I don't think. It's the inequality of all inequalities, in a sense, and this is the inequality of power. And if anyone had any doubts about that, then they really can't have been reading the newspapers or looking at the news over the last couple of weeks because it has been there in all its glaring obviousness. We've been privy to many exposures. Power is one of the great mechanisms of inequality. We see the relationships here between wealth and education and power and this positive multiplier effect in the same way that we see a negative multiplier effect of poor education, poverty and lack of control over one's life and environment. Now, housing was also a common area of discussion, whether you regard it as an asset or simply a shelter. And I must say that the genie before and after housing costs, I think, is a terrifying indictment of our attitude towards property in this day and age. It's a barrier for young people to leave home in search of jobs. And that means that they may get to university and they may get a degree, but they may still be trapped at home or trapped in areas where there are no decent jobs. Um, I have a sister who's 20 years younger than me, and I know her generation, they've, they've gone to university, they've racked up the debt, and now they can't afford to come and live in London or Manchester or Sheffield or any of those big cities. They are still at home, and this is also a barrier for these young people. It's also exacerbating a north-south um, and rural and city divide. So while costs are a big problem, also surely stagnating wages are also contributing to this problem, as well as a rise in precarious employment. And as David mentioned, universal credit, we know that this will be tipping far more people into homelessness. It will all, there are also predictions that our shocking rate of child poverty, 3 million, is set to rise to 4 million if we carry on on our economic cause. Now, I'm going to be bold among an audience of statisticians, and I'm going to say that behind every statistic, there is a human story, and that's what most concerns us. We know that facts and evidence play a part, but I think we rely too heavily on them. What really changes people's minds and persuades them is the narrative, is the stories. That's what they remember. There's a human cost to inequality. The Gini coefficient doesn't tell us what it's like to live at the sharp end of inequality. And that inequality is goal number 10 of the Sustainable Development Goals, I think, tells you something. The OECD, the IMF, the World Bank, everybody is saying that inequality is one of the biggest problems for economic reasons as well. And it's a sad thing to say that very often we have to make our campaigning case in terms of economics. You know, it's a well-known fact that when campaigners were campaigning against domestic violence and abuse, it was only when a report came out saying that it would cost the economy billions of pounds that any real action was taken. And I'm afraid this may be the way we have to direct our campaigning. So I'm just going to end by saying that we do also need to discuss solutions and how we as individuals, academics, campaigners and politicians come together to tackle a scourge of inequality, if we care. Because inequality is not inevitable. It's a result of policy choices, which means we can change it. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much to all of you. Now, if I can ask our three speakers to come up onto the uh, stage again. So I'm going to, I'm not going to try and actually sum up everything. I'm going to try and remind you of some of the key themes that came up across our very different speakers' takes on this to give you a chance to think about what is your burning question or disagreement. So just to start, we started with Danny's uh, bold assertions that income inequality is the inequality we should care most about and that we should care most about inequality between individuals and families now and not between generations. Danny also made the argument that the problem, the reason we have such high inequality in the UK is we actually don't care about it enough and that if we cared about it we would take action. He then talked us through some of the negative associations with high inequality around racism, sexism, drugs, climate change, voting, health, all these different arenas. One of the themes I thought that ran very interestingly through our three speakers was around education. So all three of them nodded enthusiastically at the idea that separating children within education is a bad thing for attainment and for individuals. I suspect their prescriptions for how, what you do about it wouldn't be quite so consensual. And I think all of our three speakers spoke about the transformational role of higher education. <coughs> that it is, to some extent, the basis of the new inequality between graduates and non-graduates. 
But again, I think what you do about that is very, very different depending on where you're coming from. So is the solution to get more and more people into that higher education to get them the returns from graduating? Or should we think about the 50% who, un who do not get that and try and reduce the impact of not having a degree in our society, in our labour market? Another key theme was obviously the housing market. So again, I think our three speakers are very unanimous that housing costs are a big driver of inequality, but I think very unclear as to where, where that takes us. Now with uh, Lord Willits we moved on, I think we had a call for better data, which in a room full of statisticians is always a winner. <laughs> um, but I think we also then had a very interesting issue raised of even within income inequality, before you move on to anything else, are there trade-offs that have to be made that politicians, campaigners, policy makers and voters have to make? So I think it's very interesting the graphs that say in any one historical period you can do very well at reducing inequality at the bottom and the top and pretty badly for the big group in the middle. Or you can do very well for the group in the middle but see inequality rise at the bottom of the top. I think it's very interesting to say really what do we care about? Coming back to Danny's point, we'll act on the things we care about but we do actually have to make a choice. And then we've also had Wanda bringing us back to some of those other inequalities and pointing out that inequalities around race, gender, disability, income aren't separate. The multiplier effect, I think, is a very useful way of thinking about it. And I was pleased to hear somebody come back to the word power, because I was thinking it would be very odd to have this conversation and not talk about the way in which inequalities drive power and power drives the inequalities. Now, I hope that's given you enough time to think of some questions, think of what you would like to put to our speakers in our last period of time. So I'm going to take two or three questions at a time and ask people to speak to them. So who would like to kick us off? Yes, thank you. Thank you very much. It's very um, engaging. It's quite different, but I really enjoyed it. Oh, yeah. Thank you very much. I really enjoyed all three presentations. My question is, if we should care, how do we care? These were all very enthralling presentations at different points, but are there any tangible um, advocacy organizations campaigning organizations, individuals, groups, et cetera, that uh, each of you would recommend if we do care about what you just talked about. Thank you. Great, thank you. We have another, another question or two to put together. Yes, gentleman at the front. I think there's a mic just coming for you. Well, I'm, I'd like to ask uh, about this assumption that David well, it's made and then later produce survey evidence to show that most people agree with them, which is that we have a social contract that successive generations should always get better. Um, why, why do you believe that? I'm, I think I'm, I'm not sure that, especially if you are concerned about the implications of always um, urging economic growth, you might think that it's time to stop with that, in which case we might have to give up some, at least of the material things that we've been focusing on to um, have a better life. Okay, thank you. So we'll tackle those two. So first of all, if people are sitting there thinking we care, what would be your top recommendation of how to act on it? And secondly, do we need to just give up on the idea that children should always do, pe do better than their parents? So start with Danny and we'll work our way down. Um, there are lots of um, organisations, David and I are both, I think, members of the Intergenerational Foundation and they're very interested in that. Uh, but I would say political parties are the most powerful. If you want to know how inequality fell from 1913 all the way to 1978, it was the Liberal Party at the beginning and the Labour Party. And the Conservative Party actually changed its stripes and the whole politics moved to the left. Since 1959, all the politics has moved to the right. Um, the Conservative Party moved so far to the right, it could no longer be a, a member of the European Conservative bloc and had to alley up with the Polish Law and Justice Party. Um, but it's politics, it's political parties uh, that change it. And if you had a political party, for instance, that said the most important thing is inequality, we're going to tackle it, and by the way, we're going to not have student loans, I'd look at them seriously and say, this is a little bit like 100 years ago, something's really going on here. Back then, people were incredulous and said, oh, you can't do that, you can't make things better. It's a trade-off, it's very complicated. 
The progressives ignored that and they made things much, much, much better. Um, future generations can have better lives, they just can't have more and more material stuff. Uh, but luckily that's already begun. We've actually already begun consuming less in absolute weight. If you want an image of this, uh, if you have children the age of my children, who are now in their teenagers, when they were young they used to get enormous amounts of plastic at Christmas. People just give these ridiculous toys that they didn't need. That kind of thing has reduced. Our actual quantity of material consumption has reduced because we got to a point, particularly in the middle class, where we had enough. So future generations do not need faster cars. They do not need more toys. What they need are happier lives and much, much better mental health than our generation have, and we can give them that. Thank you. Wonder. Well, um, it's the Christine Keeler thing, isn't it? She would say that, wouldn't she? Um, I'm going to say, join the Equality Trust. <laughs> That's exactly what we do. We campaign to reduce economic, inequality, economic and social inequality. Now, we have um, 25 local groups around the country. We are um, campaigning on a variety of issues, including pay ratios. If you want to get involved with that, we have a pay compare website where you can request pay ratios from various employers. Um, get involved with things like fairness commissions which have been set up um, but also we are in the, in the new year we are publishing our manifestos and our manifesto will be what you can do at a national level what you can do at a local level with local councils you know lobbying for a living wage those sorts of things um, even something like getting your borough to be a 20 mile an hour zone you know these are all things that individuals can do and a manifesto for individuals because quite often people do say oh we want to tackle inequality but it's huge what do we do and I quite often wake up saying that myself um, so I totally understand that one of the key things I would say is talk to people about this people realize that inequality is bad on a moral level but they don't actually realize all the other arguments behind it that it's actually doing us harm whether we're rich or poor and one of the key things we're campaigning on at the moment that I really have to give a plug to, um, one is, the, is, an in, is a cross-governmental, a cross-departmental inequality reduction strategy, so that the government has to set its policies against some sort of inequality reduction, look at its effects on, on inequality. But the other thing is, um, has anyone here heard of the socio-economic duty? No. no. Okay, well, that doesn't surprise me. Um, when the Equality Act came in in 2010, it was brought um, to the House by Labour, but then the coalition government um, saw the, the Act become enacted. There's the f Section 1 of the Equality Act says that every public body has a duty to examine and formulate its policies with, reg with due regard, which we know legally is quite a strong duty, with due regard to their effect on inequalities of outcome and disadvantaged people. Now that was not enacted in, in the Equality Act, so it's not a piece of law legislation, and we are campaigning for that to be brought in. Because, as other people have said, this could have been a clause that stopped austerity. Um, so we want to see, we, there are local councils who are enacting something like that, very similar in their areas, such as Newcastle and Leicester. The Scottish legislation is consulting on bringing that into Scotland and they will likely bring it in by the end of the year, and Wales is also looking at that as well. So we believe that would be a phenomenal tool um, that local councils and other public bodies could use. Um, on should we always be doing better, I think there is a shift towards experience rather than things, um, towards people feeling that what they actually do in life um, is, is far more um, important than the things they have within certain sectors. What I would also say as well is that um, we have to look at this issue of growth because there is an obsession with growth, whether it's inclusive growth, sustainable growth. Um, you know, it's one of the factors in one of the SDGs which calls for growth. Now, there is a very simple antidote to that. We already have enough food and enough resources to keep the people in the world going. So if we just redistributed it a bit slightly, um, then we wouldn't have to have this obsessive need for growth, which is damaging our planet and damaging our psyches as well, I would suggest. You wonder, David. Uh, in terms of the sort of ha organising to have an effect on things, what got me most focused on I intergenerational equity was going to meetings in my constituency when I was an MP, where the local residents' association, uh, uh, good people who were all active in the local community and probably serving as governors of the local school or whatever, 
would gather above all to have a protest meeting if any new housing was being proposed. Uh, and they were almost all owner-occupiers themselves. Um, and it became increasingly frustrating. And then you'd come from a surgery where some couple had been to see you with a baby and he was working at Tesco's and she was a nurse and they were still in a spare room in his parents' house. Uh, and so I first got into all this, is what is the way that you can win an argument you actually need to build more houses? Because my view is that the glaringly core message from the presentations this evening was one single thing that would boost the quality of life and reduce inequality in Britain is having more houses. If you have, if you go for 10 to 20 years when you need an extra 300,000 houses and you're lucky to build 150,000, what well, the impact on distribution of wealth ownership, on living costs, on opportunities in, and geographical mobility is massive. So any campaign that supports any houses almost anywhere will be desperately looking for support. The good news is attitudes have shifted a bit, actually. Attitudes, the number of people saying you should support housing in your area in the last five or six years has gone from 25% to 50% support. And don't sign up to every, all those petitions brought round by nice young men, that's nice older people, saying there's a terrible proposal for a block of flats uh, at the end of our road or for building on a greenfield. It's terrible. Of course, in general, we agree we need some, but not there and not in this design. Don't sign it. That's the first thing you do. Um, Organising, the second thing we're trying to do in practice at the Resolution Foundation is trying to, cap, trying to do something about the information inequality in the modern gig economy, trying to make it easier for self-employed gig economy workers to link up to other workers. Their, their parent organisations, their employers, don't make that easy. We're trying to find online ways of linking up people in the workforce, modern trade unions if you like. Uh, on the second question about attitude, well, I have to say I do profoundly disagree. I accept the issue of sustainability. I accept that some of the economic growth we've enjoyed in the past has been fake economic growth. It's been economic growth that only appeared to be growth because it didn't properly account for the environmental damage and the, your resources that were used. Uh, but I would argue actually one of the good things of progress, I believe in progress, one of the many good features of progress is by and large advanced societies have become better at getting more growth for lower energy inputs. We are about smarter and smarter at the energy product ratio. And I personally think, and this is partly because of my interest in universities, I guess, that whilst humans want to research, want to learn, want to understand things we don't currently understand, that the, the motor of innovation and new technology is going to keep turning, and a good thing too. Uh, now, it may be a nightmare scenario. I've just watched the new, the new Blade Runner and uh, not totally sure that the picture of the world that presents is a better one than written today. But uh, the, 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 the fact is the world, the, 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 uh, the, we're going to learn more stuff, we're going to develop new technologies, we're going to be able to do new things, and people a century from now, looking back on us, will be amazed at the illnesses we tolerated, at the discomforts we accepted, at the difficulty we had in learning basic things about how our own bodies were functioning and monitoring their performance, and that will all be progress, and it's a good thing. Thank you. Now, I want to, Danny, I want to ask you, are you for or against growth, and also give you a chance to come back on housing? Okay. Uh, I'm for growth that helps people. Um, and that isn't growth that necessarily increases, increases the GDP as is conventionally measured. Uh, so growth that is associated with better happiness, better mental health. That's, that's the way to look at it. Uh, we have a mental health crisis in this country. Um, we, we forget about that. Uh, on housing, um, I agree about housing. We do need to build more, more houses. Um, but some work that's just been done, and this is all about new labour, comparing the 2001 to 2011 census, has found that in London, net, all the extra housing that was built went to the best off housed 10%. It didn't improve overcrowding for the other 90%. Um, in Oxford, we've had our first house building for 30 years, and the affordable housing flats go for 400,000 at the bottom. But if you just build and don't regulate, the rich will get the second and the third home. That is what happens and has already happened. Uh, if you just do it by the market, young professionals end up in ex-council houses on their own, saying, oh, what a hell of ex-council house this is. And the family with two children who used to live there are not there anymore. 
got to work out why things have gone so badly wrong. And it's because we believe that if you just let people do what they want, and let those with the most money do the most, it'll somehow all sort itself out. And we've become the poster boy for Europe about why this isn't true. <coughs> and it's very hard when you've made a big mistake and got it very, very wrong to accept you've made a big mistake and got it very, very wrong. Okay, thank you. David, have you got anything else to say about how you would fix the housing crisis if it's not just build more houses? Well, I do think that building more houses, it's very hard to see how you can do it without building more houses. Uh, I might accept there are issues about distribution of houses, and my view is that where my party is heading, just as we did in the 1950s, is to end all the ideological taboos. It's got to be public sector housing, private housing, got to be housing in the southeast, all that. There is a deeper point here, um, which is where I think I disagree with the other two contributors. You can have a kind of static view of the world and say, look, the real issue is the distribution of houses. If you count up the number of bedrooms there are in Britain and the number of people, in principle, we could each one of us have a bedroom at night. Um, we don't need to worry so much about extra growth. If we just distributed the growth we've got more fairly, the current economy could feed the world. But in reality, the politics of distribution in a zero growth environment is far worse than sharing the increment more fairly. A strategy which actually says, let's go for the static model and redistribute is not a winning strategy. A strategy which says, we're going to grow, and we're going to grow in a way that is fair and ensures that the beneficiaries of the extra are disproportionately those who are disadvantaged, that's a winning strategy. If you try to fight all this as a zero-sum game, it's going to be very hard. That's why I'm a believer in more people going to university. That's the point of my exchange with Vince Cable. That's the reason why building more houses, it's very hard to see how you solve the problem without building more. And the, uh, the static model, I think, is... Uh, Many people find it a rather dispiriting picture of the world. And it makes the distributional issues so acute and savage that it's much less palatable to people than getting the motor of growth turning again and then s distributing the dividend more equitably. Thank you. Let's take a couple more questions. Yes. So we've got three gentlemen there, a lady, and then gentlemen. Thanks very much. Um, so, so I think um, David, your comment about uh, sort of Hume, the quote from Hume, um, that the most important sort of perception of inequality is among our peers, and wonder your 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 comment that social media is having um, a big impact. I think they're almost at odds. And do you think that? Potentially, one of the big, like a big, a big problem here could be our perception of inequality. How how important is that? Because it's not something that can easily be measured. But how important is that in the effects of inequality and the negative consequences of it? Thank you. Yep. Hi. Thank you for your um, speeches. I've got to read out a question. Um, I think your implication in David Willett's speech was about how people don't really care about the bottom or the top, and I just wanted to ask why is that? And do you think the inequality represented by the top 1% and the bottom 20% is a very separate and has no impact on the middle? Because that was the impression that I had from this talk. Thank you very much. And third question. Oh, uh, thank you for your very interesting presentations. Uh, one thing from the Labour Force survey showing that employment rates are about the highest they've ever been. Mm -hmm. We've also got a growing population. Uh, it's not quite your traditional idea of a, a kind of big, you know, problems in society, but a lot of problems are being indicated. Mm -hmm. Is it, are, are there issues around productivity, uh, that the kind of jobs that are being created are not really the jobs that are gonna offer people what they want? I mean, if, if you have a lot of graduates, if the jobs aren't there for them to do, that's going to be problematic. Great, thank you very much. Okay, so we've got uh, the perception. Is our perception of inequality changing, particularly with social media and technology? Secondly, I think it's a very interesting question about you, David. You presented the trade-offs between what happens to the top and the bottom versus what happens to the middle, but are those things actually connected? And third, the productivity puzzle. Um, 
I'll start down that end for this time. So there you go. Yeah, I think on the um, I don't know. I, I haven't thought uh, about the this, this social media question whether it is indeed Kim Kardashian that now people <laughs> are worried about. Um, there is a quite a lot of evidence from evolutionary biology and other disciplines that it's kind of the people that you are most directly in competition with, who, where, with who, who are the differences that are most relevant for you that people focus on. Um, and that seemed to be the insight in the Hume essay. But I'm not aware of, and the other two speakers may be aware of more, more evidence as to whether the arrival of social media has changed it so we really are exercised by the, the hyper-rich or whatever. I think there is some fascinating work that Polly Toynbee has done, which showed, and that was a point that Danny made, that affluent people grossly exaggerate kind of where the median income is in society and uh, don't recognise how many people are managing on significantly lower incomes than they have. And as I'm no longer an elected politician, perhaps I can just make a tiny defence of the political class, especially people in the House of Commons where I no longer sit, which is that um, when I compare English or British parliamentary democracy and constituency obligations to most other West European countries, the direct engagement and the knowledge you have to have about what is happening in your own constituency is massively greater than most other democratic systems. The press is also far more intrusive and far higher levels of scrutiny. We're a far more open society. Um, and the, the, when I talk to my German MP colleagues about what they did in their constituencies, the British model where you know, anybody can, has a right to come and see you at your surgery, letters have to be answered, you have to be around, you have to know your stuff. Um, that does mean, I would argue, that parliamentarians actually have a better understanding of this than many other groups earning as much uh, who don't have that democratic responsibility and have greater awareness than in some other countries. Unfashionable, but I think we should a modest defence of our political class. On the middle versus the top versus the bottom, of course people, I'm sure, would support a policy. If you would have said at any point, we're having going to have a policy where we're going to take from the very rich and give to the very poor, that would be a, quite a popular policy. Uh, but the point I was trying to make is if you actually care about living standards, including living standards of people who are not very affluent, people in the, in the middle or just a bit below, that period in the 1980s worked very well for them. There were a lot of people who were on no standards affluent who had more significant increases every year in their actual real pay than at any point since. And it, that is, uh, and let's face it, sometimes what people say and express as their preference when they're thinking of their own living standards and their kids, and these are not rich people, and I don't like the language of greed, they're certainly not greedy people, it's a legitimate thing to say, hang on, this machine is turning for me and my family at the moment, we're a bit more better off, we're going to be able to afford a slightly better holiday. Those are legitimate, they're not ignoble human instincts. Um, on uh, employment and productivity, yeah, it is the paradox, and everybody's worried about this, we are indeed going through, we have very high levels of employment, and we're having a very poor productivity performance at the moment. Uh, and it's one of the big structural problems of British economy. Uh, my view is, I mean, I, I don't believe in setting targets to the number of people going to university. All I would do is observe that in the last 50 years, we've gone from 5% of people going to university to 50% <coughs> of people going to university. At each stage, there have been people saying, it can't go any higher, it's too much, they're all going to be unemployed, their skills are going to be wasted. By and large, those arguments have come, they've been a kind of educational nimbyism. They're particularly put by people who themselves have gone to university, and the evidence is clear. People who've not gone to university are much more in favour of the growth of universities than people who have gone to university, which is kind of predictable. Uh, but we find that by and large, in modern economies, when you've got better educated, more recruits coming in, you find productive ways of using them. And that remains the case for graduates in the UK. This argument has suddenly been a collapse of the graduate premium or why graduates are catastrophically unemployed compared with the past is not what the evidence suggests. Indeed, there's some, been some research uh, by Richard Blundell at the IFS, for example, showing that one of the effects of having more graduates is to change the pattern of the economy so that it becomes more sophisticated, more decentralised, for example. 
but I think the, uh, uh, the, uh, uh, above all the case for going to university, and I don't think people have to go to university to choose a high salary because there's no need for them to worry about their salary. Uh, uh, if they want to have a high salary, fair enough, but it's not a reason for going to a university of itself. There are many other reasons as well. It's just a fantastic experience for three or four years. And if afterwards you're well paid, you meet the cost of it. If afterwards you're not well paid, you don't. Thank you. Wanda? Yeah, I think that the interesting question on the perception of inequality, I mean, of course, we, we talk about inequality, we look at research on inequality, but if you ask many people who are experiencing the sharp end of it, they're not going to identify it as inequality um, in the same way that a lot of people do not want to say that they are poor when they're living in poverty because of the stigma, but also because the debates that we are having are at a very different level for different people. Um, I think, I mean, when we look at... Um, when we look at the British Social Attitude Survey, we've seen an increase over the past years, especially since, as Danny alluded to, um, the publication of the Spirit Level in 2009, um, that inequality is going is further up the agenda. And we also see this in the debates of the of funders and of the third sector. I mean, Oxfam and others have had a sort of internal debate as to whether they are focusing on poverty or whether they're focusing on inequality. Um, and so that is changing the sector and it's, it's also changing attitudes. Um, I think really we have a collective responsibility. Um, it may be human nature to say, this is working for me and my family, this is fine. But actually I'd like to think that there are many people out there who feel a collective responsibility. Um, you know. Um, it may be, there are people who do want to pay more tax. There are rich people who feel they aren't paying enough tax and that they would prefer to pay tax in order to provide more money for our services. So I don't think we should take that necessarily selfish view that if people are okay, then they're not, they're not so bothered about um, the, the rest of people in, in society. And in terms of productivity, um, going back to gig economy as opposed to people who prefer to work freelance and are working freelance through choice, um, I mean, I applaud any effort to organise in that sector. It's incredibly difficult, um, and GMB have also been doing that and found it's, it's very, very difficult to do that. Um, but one of the things that we would like to do and we would like to see in schools is basic education on employment rights, because so many people go into the workplace without knowing what their basic human rights are, and that's just a recipe for exploitation. So we're working to, to um, try, and, try and solve that. But I think in terms of productivity, Zero hours contracts and those sorts of those sorts of jobs have a massive impact on people's mental health. I was listening to workers at a TUC conference who were on zero hours contracts saying, I don't know what work I'm going to have from one week to the next. I can't plan a holiday with my children. I don't even know if I'm going to have enough money for a birthday party for them. You know, that insecurity from week to week, not knowing if you're going to be able to afford your rent or even afford to put food on the table is absolutely crippling in terms of mental health. And as Danny said, we have a huge mental health problem in this country, which is starting at school level. Okay. Danny. Um, okay, on productivity. Uh, different data to what the Revolution Foundation has, which starts in 75 because of the data source. If you go back to 1945, 10 years from 1945 to 1955, huge increases in productivity and GDP, much higher than 1980s. Um, partly because we were much more equal, becoming more equal, we were giving ourselves a health service, it was worth being part of something, we were patriotic, we cared. The, the next decade, 55 to uh, 65, not quite as much, you couldn't make quite as much, still much higher than 1980s. Uh, and again, the world was changing, um, Howard Macmillan was building thousands, millions of council houses. People were paid similar amounts to each other, they worked harder. The next decade, 65 to 75, not quite as productive, again, we're going down, um, but again, things were getting better. There's Lady Chatsley's Lover's Trial, the judge said, is this a book you'd like your wife and servants to read? People laughed at them. We won a World Cup while paying footballers almost nothing. Okay, the Beatles complained about paying tax, and they were quite good at music. And then we got to the 75 to 90 graph, which was worse than all the other ones, but it was better than what came after, because inequality rose afterwards. So it isn't that the 80s were great, they were much worse than the decades um, before them. That. Graduates, is the other one I was going to say something on, uh, over half of young women in England now go to university. Now, if they're going to
going to be paid as much as my generation of graduates are paid, we're going to have to invent some new kind of bank to make so much money out of the rest of the world. It just doesn't work. It just doesn't work. It's not the same kind of thing. Now, just think about two scenarios. One is that you're a young woman, you've gone to university, you've taken out a loan, you've got a job, you're a highly qualified social worker, you're constantly worried about children dying under your care and you're paid £31,000 a year. So you can pay back £56,000 or £60,000 for the privilege of having trained to become a highly skilled social worker. £50,000, £60,000 back. Your friend who has gone to the history of art, daddy paid her fees, she's got to pay nothing back. What are these two people going to think in future? The lovely thing about student loans is that every month now students are getting letters telling them about what they're going to have to pay back. It's an unbelievable recruitment agent for greater equality uh, for the middle class. You know, you're actually telling people we're doing this to you. Oh, and it's for your own good and it's fair. Um, so something is, is going gonna, is gonna to happen out there because people aren't that silly that they're going to carry on uh, taking it. Lastly, on housing and the enormous cost that the millennials are paying in rent, just look at where the money's going to. Who's getting that money? Is it people who've built lots of wonderful homes recently for these millennials to live in? Right? Only about 2% of people are serious landlords. That's where the money's going to. And it isn't the cost of building the houses. Right? And are the millennials stupid? Oh no, half of them went to university. How long is it going to take to work out you're being ripped off? Okay, there's a seat of hope for the revolution. Um, we've got time for or one... just voting differently. <laughs> that will be a start. <laughs> we've got time for one more set of questions. So, gentleman at the front and lady the halfway back. And our third question. Oh, we've got four now. So you get to the end and everyone piles in. Uh, yeah, hello. Um, I'm very sympathetic to Dana's narrative, and I've been uh, reading his books for 20 years and following it. What seems a bit different this time is that it, 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 I sense a lot more now, Danny, it, it, you're, you're presenting it as if the problem is the, the state's fault, and that seems something of an evolution of your idea. And trying to think back at what you said, I think the only example you gave where it wasn't the state's fault was the, um, the Danes who had a a, a sort of uh, tendency to smoke, and that's why they, they weren't living as long as the Brits. So I wonder whether that was so. And I wonder if I can just give two examples at the, the top and the bottom end, which, which you know, m might shed some light on the, the British statistics. Because we do have problems, as everyone has said, with mental health, with alcoholism, with drugs, which you know, I've read in quite a few places seem to be a bit worse in many British areas than across the constant. So, you know, is that causing a particular problem in that bottom five or ten percent? And then at the very top end, you know, from my own experience of having worked in banks and now working in tech startups here, and also having a, a continental wife, I do find that you know, Britain is a uh, London is a global city. So, you know, we 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 have an awful lot of very highly paid non-British people coming here because it is a global city. And therefore, I just wonder whether that top 1%, it's not really fair to compare it with a lot of the rest of the country because they're not, you know, it, it's, it's, it's a global phenomenon. Thank you very much. Now, second question. Hi, um, thanks very much. That was really interesting. And um, I feel like it's endlessly debatable. Um, firstly, just as a personal aside, I graduated 13 years ago now and I'm still paying off my student loan and that affects my ability to get a mortgage if I could even save up to get a deposit. Um, and my main question is actually around regional inequality. I feel like it's been touched on in all of your presentations but we know that population changes mean that actually in the northwest the population is going to decrease and that's one of the only areas in the country. Everybody's flooding to London and the southeast because that's where the money is. What can we do to change that? How can we improve the north and actually make sure that growth is more equal across England and the UK. Great, thank you. Here we have. Yep. Yep. I, 
like there and then the gentleman just behind you for the last okay. question. Um, yeah, thank you all very much for, for your talks. They're very interesting. Um, I was wondering, um, you all touched on the topic of education and how it's important in the whole concept of inequality. Um, and, and Wonder mentioned that uh, it would be good to teach children about the, their employment rights to protect against uh, exploitation. I wonder generally what you see, um, uh, what is the role that education should play in the whole um, prevention of an increase of inequality going forward? Great, thank you. And last question. Uh, yeah, excellent talks. Um, I just wondered if you could speak a little bit more about the 1%. Uh, because I feel very unsure whether the one percent are uh, there's so much focus on the one percent because their wealth is so eye-catching and it's a good slogan or whether because the one percent are actually very important both statistically and practically in terms of changing these especially since you know we've heard about so many other inequalities inequalities of graduates and non-graduates those who can and can't afford a house uh, the north and the south and so on I mean how much of the focus on the one percent is important or a distraction? Great, fantastic set of questions. So, is this all the state's fault? Secondly, how much should we be caring about the 1%? Are they important or just conspicuous? And also, I think, is, this a Lon is, a, is the top 1% really a London thing, as opposed to a national issue? Third thing, what should we do about regional inequality, which is increasing, set to increase as well? And finally, what should education do to decrease and prevent the increase of inequality, as opposed to it being a driver of inequality. So, Wanda, why don't I give you first crack at those? All right. Okay. Um, I mean, it's it's no surprise. London and the South East has 40 produces 40 percent of the output, and I was alluding to that before, saying that you know graduates in other parts of the country, um, and I come from the northwest myself. Um, you know, this is a big problem. Um, and I don't think it's something that building a high-speed network is necessarily going to tackle. Um, I mean, the government, give, give its due, has moved government offices around the country so that everything isn't London-centric, but we can't get away from the fact that there are subsidies for transport are much higher in the southeast. that this is where the job, a, a lot of the job creation and a lot of the jobs and the wages, the headquarters, these sorts of things are. If we can encourage companies to move out of London um, then you know that would do something to tackle it. And the OECD's report this year um, has predicted far greater inequality for regions that were previously manufacturing regions, because you know we know that, that business and organisation are not recouping those um, sort of industrial heartlands in terms of employment. Um, I just wanted to pick up a point, and I'm, I'm sure David will correct me, but. I think the payback, is the payback of loans, does that kick in when you are earning 21,000? It has been. It's about to go up to 25, but, it, but right. I okay, introduced it at 21. I mean, that is obviously below the average, and it's not a great deal of money at, to be repaying your loans back at. I remember when I, I did my degree, and I was halfway between them, so I started my degree not anticipating having to pay money back. Um, I found myself in a position of claiming my child benefit at the same time as paying back my student loans. You know, this is how long these things take to pay back. And when I started that, the payback was £26,000. So obviously I went on to do a PhD and had years and years where the, the interest rate was more or less frozen. Now one of the academics at IOE who's working on this has said that about 85% of the loans will not be paid back. So it's a way of the government shifting sums of money that don't have to appear on their expenditure, her words, not mine. Um, the role of education, I mean, w another one of the things that we're doing at the moment is producing resources for schools and colleges um, about inequality because, you know, there, there are, it's studied at different levels in geography and some of the curricula, but we think that there is a role, um, teachers are very keen on this, that we need to be explaining to people about the structural inequalities because a little bit like poverty, people feel guilty, people feel bad because they're not able to pull themselves up by the bootstraps as you know society seems to demand. Um, and so we want to explain to them that there are bigger forces at, at work and that it's not necessarily their fault that the, circumstance, that the circumstances that they find themselves in. Um, I'm and gonna I ask you to pause perhaps unless you're burning to say something because we're nearly out no, of time. I'm, I want to <laughs> heckle the other two as well. So 
David, can I ask you to start with, do you think the top 1% are important? Yeah, can I just say something about this HE stuff and then I'll do the yes. top 1%. On the HE, um, in terms of getting a mortgage, there was a lady in the audience who asked about getting a mortgage. And obviously I discussed all this with the Council of Mortgage Lenders when we did the changes from the Blair system. Um, the mortgage lenders don't look at the debt because it's not a debt like an overdraft or, it's, or a mortgage uh, or a credit card debt. What they look at it as, quite correctly, is a fixed outgoing, like paying uh, income tax, because that's how it is. It's uh, added to your PAYE. One of the reasons for raising the threshold, the Blair system was front-end loaded, so then you paid 9% above uh, 15,000. Uh, when I was in government, we shifted to 9% above uh, 21,000. It's just been shifted, I think, an increase that uh, uh, was not necessary, but it's being certainly made it more generous, 25,000. So in Danny's example, if you're earning £31,000, uh, you will roughly be paying £40 per month uh, as in the, on the new threshold. Um, now, that is, an extra, that is a fixed outgoing, I accept that. My view is, as a way of financing higher education, compared with the generality of taxpayers, it's not the case that 85% won't be repaid. It might, it, we've got a set of decisions to take, but it's absolutely the case. If you're not well off, you won't pay back. If you are well off, you do pay back. If at any point your income will, now, if it now ever falls below 25,000, you will be paying back nothing. If you're paying only 26,000, you'll be paying 9% of 1,000 pounds. Um, given, given that people seem to want progressive systems, that is a fairly progressive system. And indeed, it is deliberately designed to prolong the payments. One of the problems with the old system was they were front end loaded costs. They were costs that people were paying much higher rates of repayment in their 20s and 30s. On the 1% issue, now, I'm going to do something very cheeky. I'm going to advise Danny on what I think socialism really should be like. <laughs> um, and I, and I, think, I think the 1%, the, the preoccupation with the 1% is a sign of a fundamental lack of confidence by people who think they're socialists. Because what it's saying is for all these things that we want in terms of uh, more expenditure on public services or whatever, don't worry, the generality of taxpayers don't have to pay for them. There's a group of people out there who are so rich that we can just charge it up to them. I don't think that, that if I look back to the kind of period that Danny clearly loves, that isn't what Attlee said. That was not what the Britain that he admires had as its core values. It didn't say there's a very small group of extremely rich people who, can, who have got... Uh, metaphorically pots of gold at the bottom of their garden and we're going to extract it from them and then we can do everything we want. The uh, socialist argument then was a far more powerful communitarian argument. We're all in this together and we're all going to have to pay more for something we all value. And when I look at the Corbyn manifesto in 2017, it's claimed there would be no extra taxes paid by anybody earning, I think, less than £70,000. His main policy was... Uh, helping graduates, by and large, in better paid jobs, uh, who wouldn't have to pay for the cost of their higher education, despite the fact, as I was saying, it's pretty progressive. And for me, wearing my Resolution Foundation hat, there was no proposal to end the flat cash cap on universal credit for people on low-income working families. This was not what I would have regarded as socialism as practiced from Attlee to Crossman. And the 1% is therefore, I would argue, a significant divergence from what I would recognise as the only kind of socialism that you would actually need if you were to fo fund the kind of increases in public services and public expenditure people actually wish to have. And I have not, in my career since 1979, observed a Labour Party that has wanted to go into an election saying people in the middle are going to have to pay more for tickets. Okay, so Danny, you've obviously got right of reply, but also if you can come back to our first Sorry, question, okay. is it now the state, do you think, do you now think this is the state's fault? Okay, um, right to reply, the, the last time I think me and David debated was in the Blavatnik School in Oxford the week before the general election. Uh, well, I said I thought there was a chance there could be a hung parliament, and I was put down as, um, you know, I didn't have a clue. Now, well, I, a would, I would never say that about you, no, Danny. There was a bit of luck. <laughs> I thought you were wrong when you were... You, you, you thought I was you wrong on the yeah, prediction. Yeah, but I didn't say you were I, I was too cowardly, admittedly, to put my prediction <laughs> in The Guardian. But, but mm. we can never know. 
and we can't know what's going to actually happen in the future. Uh, I'll come to Simon's point in a minute. Why, why do one percent matter? And it turns out the taking of the one percent correlates far better with social harms than the poverty of people at the very bottom. Why the one percent matter is by looking at how much the one percent take. It's a brilliant measure about how out of control your society has become, how badly you've controlled it. You do not make a good society out of taxing the one percent. Currently, the one percent pay a third of all income tax. Mm. Do we get a wonderful country? No. When the one percent have less, everybody else has more, which means you can tax the rest of the population decently. That is why you want the one percent to have less. Socialists have failed to explain this. They failed to explain it. If they'd explained it, they'd have done much better, but they're beginning to do better. Uh, Simon's right, I've been doing this for 20 years. I do worry, I'm turning 50 this year, and for those of you who know your social happiness curves, 50's at the bottom. Um, <laughs> I suspect it's, it's more likely that I'm just grumpy. Uh, and the good news <laughs> is I should get less grumpy, but I'm hoping uh, my less grumpiness actually coincides with things getting better. And I'll be the really annoying old person who turns up here saying, you do know inequality's fallen in the last year again. You know, that's what I want for my kind of retiring, retiring years. The more rational reason why I'm angry is that I think 20 or 30 years ago, this was much more complicated and you couldn't know what was going to happen. But as the evidence has mounted year after year after year, we finally get to a point where it is so strikingly obvious that we're in a very, very bad place and we need to do something about it. That being polite about it anymore really is inexcusable. And we have to say, we are the economically most unequal country in Europe. It is one of the reasons why we have very many problems. There is one direction in which we can go. There are lots of ways in which we can go there. There are more and more people saying we have to go there. Stop poo-pooing it. There's nothing to be proud about about being the most economically unequal country in Europe. Sometimes it's worth saying that things are very, very simple. Last point on university education. The one thing the press office of my university says to me is you can talk about anything you like, Danny, but please don't talk about who gets into Oxford University. <laughs> <laughs> right, I think we're probably the only hall in London where we have debated the meaning of socialism and we haven't debated Brexit. <laughs> so I think we can say that, that, that is an achievement. So before we close, the RSS and SRA have very kindly laid on a drinks reception where we can go and argue about Brexit with the help of alcohol, so please do stay and pick up on all the things we haven't got to. I'd like to thank our three speakers who have given us such a lot to think about and such a lot of interesting debate. And I'd like to thank the RSS and the SRA for organising and supporting this event. And of course, all of you for coming, for staying with us to the end and for raising so many good questions. So thank you very much. Thank you.